The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. It's a time. We know that the scripture says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for peace, there's a time for war. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die. There's a time for everything under the sun. There's a time. And probably the place we're going to start first, if you notice all the pops and sizzles, I had a revelation that equipment wears out just like people. It's not just people that get older, equipment gets older, and we need an entirely new sound system. We have, uh, the last Ustream CDs have all had all types of horrible uh, technological demons in them. And <laughs> the only way to resolve it is to get a new sound system. So there's a time <laughs> to prepare for the days ahead. But let's pray. Um, the word that the Lord has given me this morning is to pull highlights from the four, one, two, three, four, servant songs. How many know what the servant songs are? How many have even heard that expression? It's basically from the book of Isaiah. It's Isaiah 49, 42, 50, 52, and 53. All of those are messianic in nature. They've got multiple applications, but they are so rich and so full that when God started laying on my hearts to just go over the four servant songs, I, uh, songs, I basically just opened my heart for what stood out because there's too much, obviously. There's too much in all of those wonderful scriptures, all of which are messianic, all pertain to servanthood in one form or another. And so let's just pray because we're going to pull out those four key elements that I believe God is is causing to surface out of those four servant psalms. I keep saying psalms. Songs, S-O-N-G-S. Maybe I'm supposed to sing a psalm. I don't know. But uh, Father, we just thank you for these servant songs are full of instruction for us. And I believe that for everything under heaven, there is a season and there is a time. And the first thing that, that God laid on my heart was that it is a time to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers, the fathers to the children, just as it was prophesied in Malachi. But in particular, the, the, the Lord has used uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 17 in the New Testament uh, for some time. He says, I will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just in order to make ready a people prepared. And the emphasis for me is the turning of the hearts is to prepare people. And in every move of God, there's always been a message of repentance prior to a move of God that always required a turning. And I believe that what God is saying is that we're in a season of major change as well as preparation. And when I looked at those four uh, servant songs, I said, I'm only going to basically absorb and preach what rises up out of the midst. And in opening my heart to that, I saw that that time of turning was going to be the father to the children, children, even the disobedient children, to the wisdom of the just, and that we were in a time of returning. Now, this I've shared from time to time, (laughs) no pun intended, but... 38 years ago, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's never happened since. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, people say, oh, that scripture came off the page. No, my scripture came off the page and was in the air. I mean, here's the Bible, here was the scripture, and I read it with my entire being and never forgot it. I believe God was setting me on course for the rest of my Christian life. And I was, I was grieved by the fact 
that intelligent people, I was taught to respect intelligence when I was a kid. Um, it seemed like my mother and father respected everybody that was intelligent. But I was grieved when I saw intelligent people were going out to the Arizona desert to get on a spaceship. And I'm going, that just blew my whole paradigm of intelligent people should know better. All right? And I was grieved by that, and God basically showed me that wisdom trumps any kind of knowledge. Wisdom trumps it, and that what the world needs is not more information. They need wisdom of application for the things that God has prepared for them and has given them clearly. What to do with it, the knowledge that we have. And I saw that that scripture was Hosea chapter 3, verse 5, and it's only the old living Bible that has it stated exactly like this. It's an old living Bible, I think. Uh, Tyndale published it in 1971 or something like that, between 71 and 79. But here's the way it reads. This is what came off the page. Isn't that amazing? God used the living Bible. <gasps> he used the paraphrase version to supernaturally bring light in the air for me and read it with my entire mind. I was remember that the, the scenario is that I was grieved over intelligent people not knowing that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, that he's the Messiah and that why intelligent people wouldn't all serve God, I couldn't understand. And I felt the grief and all of a sudden the presence of God took that scripture and it says afterward afterwards. They will return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King and they will come trembling and submissive. There's the humility and the turning of the heart to repentance. They will come trembling and submissive to the Messiah their King and to His goodness in the end times. And I even had a later had a friend that was a Greek scholar and I was, I, I was explaining that verse to him by the way my spirit read it and he goes, yeah, I believe that. I said, trembling and submissive was not terror. Trembling and submissive was a reverential awe that truly this is the answer and I honor and I respect with utmost authority God as Lord. And I said, trembling and submissive and what were they trembling and submissive to? Tears would be pouring from their eyes of being startled by his goodness toward them. And even that humility leads you to an even deeper level of repentance. For the goodness of God led me to repentance. And I saw afterward, and I go, after what? After they've exhausted all of the foolishness of the reasoning mind, after they quit engaging in all the worldly arguments, after they've exhausted all efforts, to find meaning in life after they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King. And they're going to come trembling and submissive. They're going to come with a tender, humble heart at the goodness of God. And I know that even, even in my own experience, when I felt at the lowest time of my life, I saw God's goodness and I just wept. And it just brought me into a deeper level of humility and, and love for God because the more I felt I didn't deserve it, the more he lavished his favor on me and his goodness. And I'll tell you what, he won my heart doing that. And I believe God wants to win many hearts doing that. He wants to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and even the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. I saw that scripture come off the page and from that time on, I feel like my determined purpose was that I might know him because I saw a love God. I saw a God who loved and was willing to work with the disqualified, the ones that seemingly are unqualified, the little people, so to speak. As a matter of fact, I wrote my testimony to the little people, to the people who don't think they'll ever amount to much in this world. There's somebody in the eyes of God and that you can't judge it by the externals. You judge it by man looks at the outward appearance, but God is looking at the heart. So I saw that there's a time of returning and that this is even now that the season we're in. 
And then God basically said, uh, out of Isaiah 60, he told me that this is a time that your sons and your daughters are going to come from afar. And these sons and these daughters that are coming from afar to think generational because some of them aren't even born yet. Some of them are going to be influenced by the substance of what God puts in you and it's going to be reproduced and replicated long after you're gone. David served the purposes of God for his generation, but David's still ministering to people even through the word, isn't he? He's still ministering by the life he lived, by the mistakes he made, and by the the way he responded even to his mistakes. All of those are Holy Spirit lessons for us in the area of servanthood. And I know God's speaking humility. And humility is something that once you think you got it, you probably lost it. But (laughs) pride doesn't see itself, does it? Pride doesn't see itself. You have to basically do what David did in Psalm 19. He said, search me, O God, for secret sin because the heart is deceitful and wicked. And you always think I'm not as, pride always thinks I'm not as bad as the other guy. There's always somebody worse. Pride will even take assistance. Pride will even let you help them a little bit. But pride doesn't totally surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Everything rooted in humility is rooted in God. Everything rooted in pride is rooted in Satan. It's time to turn, return to the simplicity of Christ and quit rationalizing and making excuses for ourselves and basically humbling ourselves before God that he might exalt. He resists the proud, but he's giving grace to the humble. He said, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen. Lift up your eyes all around. They gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters will be nursed at your side. God basically said, these sons and daughters that are going to be coming are going to be coming generational. We have to start thinking generational. God thinks generational. What I mean by generational is remember, he doesn't live in our time element. God was, is, and is yet to come. He always was, he always will be. When he says things, he says things like, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's a mindset. God's looking for true servants and true believers that serve the purposes of God for their generation, but believe with all of their heart that the substance of the reality of a changed life will impact the blessings upon my children and my children's children. I think that way. I live that way. And I found out that in times of obscurity, in times when you feel like your life doesn't mean nothing, by the way, I had two choices then. When I feel like my, I don't see the fruit or what, what's but my determined purpose is that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his person. That kept me on track along with the fact that I would remind myself periodically that if my life is wasted, it's his life to waste. I am no longer my own. I was bought with a price. If you could cultivate and maintain with any level of consistency, God says, they that humble me, I will or basically you honor me by your humility, I will honor you. But it's God that lifts up one and puts down another. When you put yourself up, you're going to crash. Doesn't pride come before a fall? (laughs) The haughty spirit before destruction. So all of these things God was speaking to me and then basically said, I'm going to take you to the four servant songs and the nugget that comes forth out of that, preach that. Because these scriptures are too rich to preach them in their entirety. I couldn't do it. There's levels of that that I need to absorb and become a partaker. But these things that I do know and these things that are real, these are the things that I'm going to proclaim today. Because I believe that God said there's a time and today's the day for such a time as this. Isaiah 42 is the first servant song (laughs) and in that servant song in Isaiah 42 two truths rose out that have impacted me my entire Christian life in the endeavor to serve God as a servant of the Lord the first one was Isaiah 42 verses 1 through 4 behold my servant You can personalize this. Make this your own. I know it's messianic. I know it's Jesus. But aren't, as he was to the Father, a son to the Father, aren't we to be sons unto the Father as well? For he was the firstborn 
amongst many brethren. So sons and daughters need to have the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Behold my servant who I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I don't know about you, but I was born invisible to my earthly father. And I knew rejection because he knew rejection from his father. He couldn't give it to me anyway. But the first time that I entered into a deep, intimate dimension with God, guess what he revealed to me? Dennis, I'm giving you my undivided attention and you are my constant delight. Oh, I didn't have any place to put that. I was never anybody's constant delight. But I'll tell you what, I absorbed it. I mean, I was the kind of boy that only a mother could love, really. <laughs> anyway, uh, Dennis the Menace, I mean, I lived up to that. And that's probably the mild end. But to think that God delighted, that would be like when I wake up, he's up. Oh, my son is up. I had no place to put that. But I drank it in because it's a legitimate need for attention and acceptance and approval, isn't it? I wasn't going to wait around to get it from people. I got it from God. And it was the wisest thing I ever did as a servant of God was to receive a legitimate need from God instead of demanding it from people. You can spend your whole lifetime trying to get it from people. Good luck. But when God said that, behold my servant in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit on him. And I want to know, I, 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 I don't, now, how to say this clearly, but I know that I know when I got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, I knew that there was an anointing upon my life. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. I didn't know how to explain it, but I knew it was there. I would talk to unsaved relatives, tough guys. Some of my relatives were tough guys. And I would talk to them and tears would pour out of their eyes and I wasn't even really witnessing strong. They would just cry in my presence and I knew that that had nothing to do with Dennis the Menace. <laughs> I have nothing of value, that that was the anointing of God and that we have an anointing and it abides within all of us. It's the ability to humble ourselves and release that anointing rather than have it restricted and confined by our soulish, selfish flesh. Somehow the alabaster box must break open so that the fragrance of Christ can come out. And that's, that's part of what God was saying. But in this verse of Scripture, Isaiah 42, 1 to 4, it said, he will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench. I learned in that portion of the servant song as a baby Christian from that time on that I didn't care what I saw in Pentecost. I don't care what I saw in other churches. That I felt that if people were broken hearted that I needed that approach as opposed to my Pentecostal brethren that were shouting everything out shaking their heads, pushing them over doing whatever it took to get their to look like they got power alright, not everybody did that but I'm just saying I saw volume was being equated with anointing and I said there's so many hurting people in the body of Christ there's some areas in their life they don't need it shouted out they needed somebody to basically whisper. As a matter of fact, when Jennifer and I met, there was what, 90, 100 intercessors from Brownsville, Morningstar, and Jacksonville. And a lady freaked out. And to not draw, I mean, how can you not draw attention? If you freak out and 90 people are looking at you, you're kind of the center of the attention. But nobody was helping her, so I walked over and I knelt and I whispered. And she got deliverance and emotional healing and stood up with a countenance of joy on her face. And Jennifer says, what did you say at that point? Doc? Hmm, this could change the way church is being done. This is big. That was quiet and gentle. You don't have to shout everything out. And there's areas in people's life where to heal the brokenhearted, you need to do the attitude. Was Jesus powerful or not? Yeah. Was he? But yet it said, a bruised reed he won't break and a very barely smoking candle <laughs> of a Christian, he won't snuff them out. But he'll fan it into flame and he'll gently restore and he will woo them to a place of wholeness. So if there was anything in the Isaiah 42 in the first 
s- servant song, one of the two items that really stood out, that was one of them. And from that time forward, I said, I don't care what everybody else does. As a matter of fact, when we used to go church to church, we used to have pastors say, it's interesting that Dennis and Jennifer minister with such gentleness. Like it's a foreign, like, that's not ministry. <laughs> you can't minister gentle. Don't you know, we got to shout it out. We got to make noise. It's got to be over the top. Sometimes it is, and that's okay. But there's also another side to this Messiah. And the interesting thing is, is the manifestation in Isaiah 42 of the servant is out of all the names of God, Jehovah Sabaoth is used 290 times in the scriptures where Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shema, all the other names of God are used 20, 30 times. So he's a warrior, isn't he? And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to set the captives free, to uh, heal the brokenhearted, to restore. They're, they're, that anointing is there and it's powerful. And the concept is that he was harsh on sin, but he was gentle with the victims. He made that distinction, something we should all make a distinction, the sin and the sinner. As long as the sinner is attached to their sin, there's times when you must, you must say, I will not even eat with them. That's a form of discipline that's lacking in the church. We go into uh, false sympathy and non-redemptive mercy. But he's saying a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. Although he resists the proud. So what he's looking for, even in the, even in the most difficult individual who seems to be totally under the weather, God says, I'm not going to snuff you out. If you'll humble yourself, I can lift you up. There's always grace. And I saw that love restraining for the benefit of other people is power. Do you believe that? The love of God, the nature of God, restrained for the benefit of other people is basically power under control. That's actually a fruit of the Spirit. And here were the two scriptures that when God was teaching me on the gentleness, He was teaching me two scriptures that I've had for 38 years. Proverbs 16.32 and Proverbs 25.28. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. That's power. He who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. So basically what God was saying is true lordship, true power in the kingdom is to the ability you rule your spirit. Not rule over people, demand, proclaim, prophesy, all of those things are wonderful, but that is not coming out of your soulish nature. That needs to come out of the submission or the surrender to the lordship of Jesus. Now, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules the spirit than he who takes the city. Proverbs 25 gives the reverse side. Whoever has no rule over his spirit, it's like a city broken down without walls. In other words, if you don't have any rule over your spirit, the enemy can come in any time he wants. Anytime, anywhere, any season, you're always a victim. But God's basically saying that this is a time of the warrior. This is a time to where he wants to break the chains, where he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the broken heart, proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of the sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jubilee is a type of forgiveness and release that needs to become an attitude of our That's why we're not to have things in our hands, but we're to have an open hand for the relationship to God. And he owns everything. That's including your gifts, your talents, <laughs> and your possessions. And he had me pray for years for the seven thrones of my life to be yielded to him. My spirit 
and I would treat it individually. These are individual topics. I'm not going to get into this. But the seven thrones were, I would release that my spirit belongs to the lordship of Jesus and none other. I will not tolerate a spirit of fear because God didn't give it to me. I'm not taking it in. Be surprised how that works when your spirit is devoted to his lordship. How do I know? Peace will rule. When Jesus rules, peace rules. Then I gave him my mind. And I used to pray even, God, I understand there's a lot of brain cells that aren't being used. Fill them with your wisdom. I, don't, I want good stewardship of that brain. And if there's parts of my brain that aren't functioning and they're just kind of there, that's not good stewardship. I welcome for supernatural wisdom and insight to flow into those areas that I can recall at, at your prompting that you can r cause that to rise up and renew that mind and make it more usable. And then my will. I yield my will. I understand that my will is here, not here. Major revelation. And that the door of my heart is here and my will opens to you. And so teach me to keep a yielded life. In other words, break the power of control because as I yield to him, you take control. When you're in control, nobody can control someone who's under control. Major revelation. All of that was in the gentleness of God and under the un concept of ruling your own spirit. As a matter of fact, we're going to be teaching Morningstar students first year. We're going to teach them the title they gave us was Spiritual Alignment. And then in brackets, drop down. How to, <laughs> how to drop down your spirit. But that is spiritual alignment. Spiritual alignment is basically knowing how to make Jesus Lord not just saying Jesus is Lord. How do you make him Lord? How do you know he's Lord? How do you practice the presence of his Lordship to where you have, you're not going to be one of those, did I not cast out devils? Did I not prophesy? Lord, Lord. And he goes, I knew you not. There's a big problem there, isn't there? And our identity is in the relationship, not in our gifts. Not in what you do, but what you are. Are trumps doing. And the doing should flow out of what you are. Good to be humble. The second aspect or truth or nugget or revelation that comes from Isaiah 42, that first servant song, came rather recently. And it was God gave me a vision, a little mini vision that's as rich today as it was then, of Isaiah 42:13 where now it's not the silent, quiet, hold your peace. Now it's the Lord, the warrior, rises with a shout like a mighty man. I like that. Oh, there's two sides to this coin. He's quiet and he's loud. Oh my goodness. How do I make the transition? Huh? But basically what it said was, the Lord will go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He'll cry out, yes, shout aloud, and he shall prevail against his enemies. But that Messiah is on the inside of us. And when he rises up as the warrior, there's no weapon formed against you that will ever prosper while he is Lord and while he's manifesting as a warrior. And 290 times, as far as the names of God, he's mentioned as Jehovah Sabaoth, the warrior. So he's gentle and meek to heal the brokenhearted, to not quench the dimly burning flax, but at the same time, he's a mighty warrior that rises up. And when God gave me that vision, he showed me a slimy net. You know what a net is? A trap. Like you trap an animal on a net. Only this net was like slimy spaghetti. I'll make it a little milder so that people don't spoil your lunch. A slimy spaghetti net, interwoven, and God says seducing spirits are holding those uh, weavings, so to speak, together. And he says they are idols and agendas. Yeah, agendas. That could be even something that in and of itself is not bad. It could be something that you've turned into an idolatrous relationship, even though in and of itself it's not bad. And a seducing spirit has you so off track from the lordship of Jesus that you're actually serving something, that even socially acceptable things. You can make a God, we learned this, we saw people make a God out of their husband, out of their wife, out of their education, 
You could take things that God intended for you to do, but you can make a God out of it. And God is basically saying, love, 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 just like 1 John. Love, 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 love. But what did he say at the very end? Love, 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 love. Little children, keep yourself from idols. That was not like a thought that wasn't connected to the love. Because you can't love the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. If the love of the Father is in you, you're not worried about the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, all of which are in the world. So this warrior that rose through that, when he broke through that, he broke through that net with a shout. God says, you're going to see in the congregation and testimonies even in our ministry that we were going to see dramatic changes where soul ties were strong shall be broken, where people's agendas and idolatrous relationships were going to be severed easily and quickly by the anointing of God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach that gospel to the poor, to separate that stuff. He does it by His anointing. And then God said it's even better. And you know what else I'm doing? After that network is broken, I'm getting ahead of the story here. He said, Remember he, a dimly burning wick? He says, your loving intercession is to push back the powers of darkness around people to make a free will decision. Prayed like that most of my life. Because I know I don't interfere with people's will because that's witchcraft. But I push back the powers of darkness and let the love of God push the powers of darkness from around them that they, they, that they themselves can make a free will decision for God. Well, God says, because of that proper attitude, I'm doing this. I'm going to fan into flame some sparks that were in those people that you're interceding for. I'm going to cause seeds that have been planted in times past that lie dormant to be ignited. I will not quench a dimly burning wick. I will not snuff out or damage a bruised reed. And so not only is that net broken by the warrior rising up, that servant warrior, but now God says, I'm going to ignite and I'm going to draw sons and daughters to you. And these sons and daughters are going to have a new fresh ignition. Kind of like the prodigal coming back to the father. He came to himself. It's going to be like they're going to think it's their own idea, but it's going to be the initiation of God inside them that's basically turning the hearts of the children back to the father just as the heart of the father is turned toward the children. And there's going to be a reunion, a Holy Spirit reunion. And so keep on praying for that intercession for your loved ones because God is doing it. But he says, I am going to then cause out of that ignition a knitting of hearts that just like there was a slimy net restricting my people, so there is going to be like a wicker chair, a place of habitation, I'm going to interdependently knit the body together in local assemblies, basically around the world, and I'm going to knit them together to hold the weight of my presence. That's why even in the exercises we're doing during the worship trainings, and you don't want to miss the worship training. This is not worship service as usual that we're doing here. In the training session, we're teaching people to be interdependent, to make a spiritual connection. You're not programmed that way. You're pretty much programmed me and God, me and God. Then you come together corporately, you're a crowd. God's saying the day of the, of the heap of stones is over that I am bringing and weaving together living stones, a habitation of God in the spirit, a place of a building that he, that he can dwell and a chair woven together with greater and lesser knittings. Do you know that we are knit together? That we are individually members of one another? This stuff needs to be removed from the theoretical realm into the spiritual reality of a real relationship with God and with one another because God is forming that. And I believe that that is the nugget out of the first servant song. You think that's important? I own that. That's written on a tablet of my heart, so it's easy to just sit and say, God, what surfaces? What surfaces? So I'm telling you, it's a time of the warrior. It's a time of gentle power, as well as the warfare that shouts with shouts of deliverance. There's a time to be quiet and hold back your voice. There's a time to speak. And God's going to train you in knowing the difference. That's where the wisdom comes in.
Isaiah 49, the second, the second servant song. Isaiah 49, God, what are you pulling out of this? He's basically saying it's a time for it to be a light to the world. Did you know that you were all called by Matthew 28 to go to the whole world? Some of you have not gone to school and walked in the steps of obedience that are necessary for you to become part of that. But that's not for certain people. That's not for evangelists. That's for absolutely everybody that's been discipled by the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You are called to go ye into all the world. Don't look at other people to do it. You are called. Now, how you go into the world needs to be spiritually understood because you can participate in many different ways, right? It's a heart attitude and it's a heart participation but there has to be a willingness of heart. But in Isaiah 49, that second servant's song, God showed me there was two aspects to that. First, there was the time of obscurity before being there a time to be a light to the world. So in other words, part of your mentorship part of your discipleship training under the Lordship of Jesus Christ was, believe it or not, He was training you in obscurity, watching how you behave when no one's looking to prepare you for the day that you go into all the world. Many are called, few are commissioned. You know that as many are called, few are chosen. Many are called, few are commissioned. Why are they not commissioned? Because they were called, but didn't allow themselves to be properly prepared. So therefore, go ye into all the world. That's everybody. Is everybody doing that? Cooperating with that? Probably not. But the time is now that God's saying, In the shadow of his hand he has hidden me and made me a polished chaff in his quiver. He has hidden me. When was the polishing done? When was the real transformation being done? In obscurity. Did not Jesus even illustrate that obscurity as a servant? Didn't he do that? Wasn't he even born in obscurity? Then God's basically saying, it's time to take that which has been in obscurity, that which has been hidden, even when he opened the heavens, that which was hidden was the training ground of our servant Jesus, the Messiah. In his training, he was hidden, born in obscurity, trained in obscurity, but when the heavens opened said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, he was commissioned. You, you and your message will be a light to the world. You don't graduate unless you go to school. You don't go to school, you don't graduate. You can't skip the steps. So this Psalm, I mean, this Isaiah 42 basically said that there is preparation in the quiver, a polished shaft. He has hidden me. And I will someday be glorified in you. Which means you have potential, but you're not there yet. What does potential mean? You haven't done it yet. All right? But you shall be glor- I shall be glorified in you. I'm speaking to your potential. <laughs> All right? And later... Because this servant pleased God, in verse 6 of Isaiah 49, it says, Indeed, he says, it's too small of a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. You brought healing. You brought restoration. But now I'm going to give you as a light to the Gentiles that they may know my salvation to the ends of the earth. You have to be faithful in little things before you're faithful in much. God is watching the faithfulness. That's a law of fidelity. You can't change that. If you're not faithful in another man's ministry, why would God give you your own? Think about it. I learned that the hard way. I'll never forget that day where I held hands with 13 people in in Ohio, in a little meeting in Ohio. Because I knew from the time that I was born again, I was called to plant churches. I knew that was my DNA, to plant, to start a work from scratch, not somebody else's work. And then God said, 
Dennis, I'm not in this. <laughs> that was humiliation, not humble. That was humiliation. And from that time on, I saw that even though that calling was in me, you can get you in trouble, can it? You can create an Ishmael very easily out of a legitimate commissioning that is potentially on the inside. Then I went to a large church of uh, 11, 1,200 people, and I submitted to that man. And many years later, him and three well-known pastors, people that were confirmed as major leaders nationally in the body of Christ. Three of them invited me to go to lunch to say, now it's time to start your church. And you know what the word was? Because, Dennis, you were faithful in another man's ministry, God has given you your own. So I learned it the hard way. I did it wrong, then I did it right. And I did it right so well that I almost would have never started. I was happy seeing that I was going to do whatever it took in prayer, physical labor, finances to make that man successful. That it almost took me to be pulled out of that. I was so entrenched with it that when it was time, it actually took three major leaders to take me to lunch and convince me. And one of them had to give me money. That really convinced me because that was my buddy who's a multimillionaire now. But I knew how he was with money. <laughs> and I was thinking, if he gave me money, that's got to be God. All right. If, if he's watching, I know better. It's actually quite generous. But he said, I'm sowing into something. And I believe God's done that with all of us. He sowed into something, and that potential's in every one of us. The seeds, the seeds of the fullness and full stature is in everybody. All right, so those are the, the two things that really rose up out of the servant song of Isaiah 49. The third servant song, I own this one as well. When God wouldn't let me go to the Bible school I wanted to go to, he let me take them all by correspondence, but he didn't let me actually go. Um, so I took them all. <laughs> I was afraid I was going to miss something. So I took the Baptist, I took the Assemblies of God, I took the faith camp, and I took the kingdom camp, and then learned what were the differences in, amongst them. And the prophetic camp, the kingdom camp, the uh, latter rain camp, uh, word of faith, and, and the Baptist. I made sure I was covering, I wanted to know everything so I didn't lose anything because God wouldn't let me go to school. But when he took me to the school of the Spirit, he said, Dennis, I'm going to teach you. He taught me from Isaiah 50. So that one's very real to me to this day. He took Isaiah 50 and said, I'm going to mold you and transform you into my image because you've got a lot of flesh that is not what I want. Oh, can you imagine that? Dennis had a lot of flesh. Oh. But the first step was, very first step in Isaiah 50, is God says, I'm going to cause you to be a spokesman. I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple, my disciple. I'm going to, I'm going to train you and teach you, but the first thing I'm going to get you to do is to shut up. I was offended. I was a talker. I liked to talk. I was a nightmare in Bible studies. Even when the pastor was running, I'd interrupt him and tell him what I thought. And then justified it because I was right. And then I would feel like, and then I feel this creepy conviction come in right after. That's how you know you're wrong. It's that feeling right after you say something and it goes, that means you probably should have shut up. All right. That even what you, what you said was right, it would have been probably better left unsaid. I even had a prophetess come to me and lay hands on me laughing, which that was humiliating enough. She laughed forever. And she says, Dennis, God loves your heart because you've got Jesus by the hand and you go, come on, Jesus, let's go do this. Come on, Jesus, go do that. And she says, he loves your heart, but it doesn't work that way. You don't take him where you want to go. He wants to take you where he wants to go. Oh. I had to shut up. I couldn't go wherever I wanted to go. And he basically took this. He says, I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple. 
so that you learn how to speak a word in season to them that are weary. I think that's where the gentleness came in. That's where I believe that in, for the bruised reeds and the dimly burning flax, you don't need to shout it out in their case. They need the tenderness of allowing God to put their finger on the wound, bringing healing to the wound and restoration. I'm going to teach you how to speak a word to whom specifically? To the weary. There's an anointing of strength for those who are weak. You who are strong, restore them that are weak. You who are spiritual, restore. And that was the basic thrust of that. And then it says, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear. The first lesson he taught me with that was that I'm a sound sleeper and I love my sleep. And I love my three coffees to wake up in the morning. I, I am a slow. Even Vicky would come and do book work and she'd say, have you had your coffee yet? Uh, I'm not going to even waste my time talking to you if you haven't had your coffee yet. Because they're all, uh, but God says, you can wake up on your own but you need to awaken your ear to hear. And I will awaken your ear to hear, but you're going to posture yourself for that awareness. And that awareness is not just listening for a word. That awareness for my hearing ear was to even feel the slightest impression. And the first time he awakened my ear like that was in a sound sleep. It felt like just a mild impression, like you would take a feather and just wipe it across your hand I felt it across my heart and I knew that was God wanting to commune and I am my body wants to stay in bed so God gave me wisdom I stuck one leg out of the bed and gravity pulled me out and I got on my knees and I enjoyed sweet communion with him but he was training me that to hear my voice it's the still small voice it's not the shout it's not the earthquake, it's not the, it's not the uh, fire, and it's not in the wind, it's in the still, small, small voice. And that I had to learn to respond even to an impression that a voice isn't always, Dennis, get up. Dennis, are you listening? It's not always in the way that we're accustomed to. He can speak in dreams, he can speak through circumstances. But for me, he spoke through touch, impression, inner knowings, just a slight brush across the, and Isaiah 50 was my training ground for the school of the spirit apart from anything I studied under anybody else's teaching and to this day that's still the most precious because he brought and aroused the sensitivity he opened my ear and I did not turn away the second aspect of that the second and probably one of the most important parts of that was that I have set my face like flint. And God basically from that point on and to this day, still in that servant song, the humility that's required was a steadfast devotion to purpose. And if there's anyone there listening to anything that I'm saying, God has put something in you and you can go in all different directions in your endeavors to learn and acquire knowledge and to search for this and search for that, even in the kingdom. But God says, those things that I put in you in the form of divine purpose, steadfast devotion to that purpose and set your face like flint, that anything that was successful by God's standards in ministry came about by a steadfast devotion to purpose regardless of external circumstances. I'm as comfortable preaching a message that God gives me to two people as I am 10,000. It makes absolutely no difference. If you are still a candidate to where your surroundings shape you, you have lost the steadfast determination of purpose. David served the purposes of God for his generation. And it was generationally a blessing to us even today, wasn't it? Steadfast devotion to purpose means, matter of fact, we had people comment on it. When we traveled in ministry, we would do house groups that had three people. And that's how we made a living. Most of the time it was seven days a week because we were relatively unknown. And so we would just go wherever God put a divine connection 
And that's how we made a living. And sometimes we'd get so excited in ministering, we forgot to even take and receive an offering. And then we'd go, oh my God, we can't do this. This doesn't work. We need an administrator. And Jennifer looked at me and she goes, no, we need a nanny. We need, <laughs> we need more than an administrator. We need a nanny. But God somehow always worked it for good. But basically, those two truths, that God was saying this is a time to grow into full stature. We even named the ministry full stature uh, many years ago because growing up was the emphasis that God taught me in Isaiah 50. Isaiah 50 was the curriculum for maturity. Everything that we've taught, even in, uh, even in simple prayer, all came from the instructions in Isaiah 50. I'm the master, you're the student. When you go to school, the students don't do all the talking, the teachers do. Jesus says, I'm the teacher, so you shut up. You don't have anything to say, Dennis, until you've heard something anyway. That was a crush to my talkativeness. But God said, it's time to grow up before we go up, you know. And in that, he taught me that the way to move from youth to maturity would be interdependence. It's a very strong weakness in the church at large. And that is because a person is no longer sickly dependent, they've made progress. Just like John spoke, did he not? I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven. I speak to you young men because the word of God abides in you strong and you've overcome the wicked one. In other words, you got victory in your life. You know the word inside out and backwards. But it stops there. Well, teenagers could stop there technically, right? God's saying, no, 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 no. Full stature means I want mature sons and daughters that think like me, act like me, and are fathers and mothers. In other words, take over the family business is full adoption. Full adoption as sons and daughters is to take over the family business, to think like I think. Look at that elder brother. That elder brother saw himself as quite obedient, didn't he? He did everything right, but he never caught the father's heart. He stayed in that rebellion even though he was judging himself by his function and his duties and his independence. I don't get no help from my younger brother. I do it all by myself. I'm a self-made man or a woman. I don't need anybody to help me. Anybody ever pride themselves that you don't need anybody to help you? Pride doesn't see itself. God's going to say, there are times in your Christian life, you're going to love this, and these are the people I worry about, who have never received ministry from anyone else. They want to minister to people, but they can't receive ministry. Confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. God will purposely let you struggle with certain things. He wants you independent. He wants a relationship between you and him. He doesn't want you sickly dependent on flesh. That's the whole message of full stature. To stand on your own two feet in self-governance. However, there will come a time to make sure that the pride hasn't taken root where there will be some things you will never be successful with until you open up to someone else. Confess your faults one to another to be healed. He doesn't want you so independent that you stay a teenager the rest of your life. He, wa- he loves that independence over sickly dependence, but he wants you to be a father and a mother to where you're free enough to say, the things you've seen in me, the things you've heard, these things do. That's a father, that's a mother. And God's looking to raise up mature mothers and fathers. That's what I see in Isaiah 50. And that servant song, it's the, basically the process of being grounded, sanctified, and grow up from youth to maturity. And to get to the place where you graduate from that independence to inter, listen to me, interdependence. You don't lose your identity and you don't lose your independence. But you are independently coming to the realization that I am part of something bigger than me, and it's called the body of Christ. And God ultimately says, my determined purpose is this, that you would be one. My determined purpose is that your love one toward another will be the ultimate demonstration of my kingdom on earth. 
the ultimate that they might believe, that the world might believe by your love one toward another. So you have not arrived in your rugged individualism. You arrive in your ability to humble yourself into interdependence. So I saw that Isaiah 50 is a life message for all of us. That the potential in us needs to be awakened. And that is the nugget that came out of the servant psalm of Isaiah 52 and 53. Everyone knows those chapters. But when I said, God, what part is really speaking to us now? For it's a time to wake up. And it was Isaiah 52. Awake, awake, and put on strength, O Zion. It's time to wake. You know, you do stuff in your sleep that you wouldn't do if you were awake. You think things in your sleep that you wouldn't think if you were awake. Am I right? You ever get embarrassed by your dreams? I hope so. Because some of them are pretty irrational. Some of them simply reveal your emotional condition before you went to bed, your unresolved issues. I like Jennifer says when you say, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, that there's a physiological benefit to that. That unresolved conflict, and then you sleep on it, you let the sun go down on an unresolved conflict, it hardwires into long-term memory. You want to honor the temple of the Holy Spirit, you're going to start dealing quickly with the issues in your life. Come to terms quickly. But in... Isaiah 52 and 53, obviously messianic. That servant song, the fourth servant song, basically what stood out is to prepare. Remember in the beginning we said to make ready a people prepared? A turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children. John the Baptist and Elijah message needs to go forward. Repentance must precede. What does it precede? An awakening. What was 52 and 53? It was the suffering servant and the atonement of, of the Messiah and how he was going to be literally raised from the dead in resurrection life. And God is bringing that resurrection life in us to the forefront. And we're going to believe for an awakening and prepare ourselves for an awakening. Surely he has borne our grief and our sorrow. He's taken our pain. Much of the message that we believe has to go throughout the world is you don't have to wait. Here's the theology that needs to be changed in the church about the emotions primarily is some people still believe based on their experience that God can take your pain and your sorrow but he does it sovereignly in his good old time. Wrong. That was developed by people who basically didn't know how to take their pain and their sorrow properly to Christ. Repentance is not repent. Now this is evangelical Bible school, this is charismatic Bible school, this is all Bible schools. True repentance is not repentance unless it's mental, emotional, and volitional. So you didn't forgive or repent if you still got bitterness in your heart. I'm sorry. You don't wait for God someday sovereignly take that bitterness away. No. You have to learn to properly humble yourself, present it to him, and he will take it every time. God will never turn away someone who wants to repent. When you got saved, did you have to wait for it a long time for a change, or was the forgiveness instant? I opened my heart, I received the cleansing of my sin, and I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. I didn't wait for it then God to pick and choose the time on when he would make me have peace. I had peace with God, peace with myself, and peace with one another instant. Forgiveness is instant. Repentance is instant. Restoration can be a process. But the supernatural transaction is instant. The process, we get the process moved. I'll tell you what, I believe that what God's called us to do to take a message around the world, literally to the nations at this such a time as this, is basically to take the beauty of what the evangelicals have learned and the beauty of what the charismatic prophetic kingdom churches have learned and merged the two together. It's not either or, it's both. The evangelicals, to be honest with you charismatics, are quite frankly better at the process. A lot of times it's flesh and legalism, but they're at least in love with the work of the cross as far as a process, whether they do it right or wrong. The process, the process. You come over to prophetic and charismatic people and it's the encounter, the encounter, the encounter. But some of you, you, 
are living between encounters and it's been years since the last encounter. I can't live that way. I want to live to where there is a beautiful merging of the encounter and the process. The encounter is instant and then hold it and let it process in you. That's maturity. To the degree that you resist circumstances and negative people, to the degree you resist, you build spiritual muscle. You build maturity. Maturity is to the degree you resist with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Resist what? Resist the things that are out of your control anyway. And God's looking for your response to them more than He's looking for you to change everything around you. But everything we teach is how to encounter God. But we don't stop there. Once you encounter there, you feel that? Once you feel it, that's a peace. That peace of God, that's the rule of God. Now, st don't let go of that rule. Stay under that lordship. Everything we teach is how to be Lord. No one's going to come to people with training and say, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? And God's going to say, I knew you not. I want to believe that everyone is going to be so proficient in encountering God that they know that they do even like when God was going to train me. He didn't let me just do whatever I wanted. He says, I'm giving you one verse of scripture and you'll spend the rest of your life developing that. And I said, which one's that? Philippians 3.10. And the Amplified, it says that I might know him that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood. And you know what? I'm still learning about his personhood. I'm first now entering into a, a revelation of the warrior after all these years. The revelation of the warrior in Isaiah 42 is first now emerging, and by golly, I enjoy it because I'm seeing impossible situations, what they used to call impossible situations, I'm seeing people set free. And you are such a people for such a time as this. So start believing, start expanding, opening your heart. Don't, don't sit there and go, oh, that's too hard. Because look, at, I'm standing before you as a testimony to Christians who told me later that they wouldn't pray for me because I was such a hopeless case. I kick the devil in the teeth now. Hmm? Isn't that fun? Give about it. Christians came up, Dennis, you are so far gone, we didn't even bother praying for you. We were looking for easier people, <laughs> people that were more open. I had a guy come in and witness to me when I was managing a shoe store uh, in my early 20s. And he came in and would tell me about Jesus. I physically picked him up and threw him out. I had this orthopedic shoe store manager who was trying to mentor me from South Chicago, Mr. Miller. And I'd come in and have a complaining customer. I took the complaining customer out in the parking lot and beat him up. I came in with my sweater all ripped off me and he would just shake his head and he goes, Dennis, you got a lot of potential. <laughs> but that's not the way you deal with customers, complaining customers, you know. I was hopeless. However, when I did get saved, I went 20 miles away to a church that had Catholics and Protestants. Larry Tomsack was there and they were ministering. I went 20 miles away and that kid that I picked up and threw out of my store, he goes, hi, Deb. I knew I would see you someday. Yeah. I go, Gotcha. God has the last word, doesn't he? Hmm? So, Father, we just thank you that there's, this is a time to wake up. This is a time in Isaiah 52 where it's time to wake up and God's going to kindle a flame in the hearts and lives of ours. It's a time for intercession, yes, but it's a time to believe for a miraculous change in our intercession. It's time for resurrection life. But no resurrection life is just going to fall out of heaven because you've been showing up. Resurrection life is going to fall out on those where there's a death, burial, then a resurrection. You cannot have the resurrection or an awakening if there's not been a certain death. And God is preceding this message by humility. Humility is going to be rooting us in God. Pride roots us in Satan. And God's basically saying this is a time for the overcomers. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their life unto death. The atonement, the death, burial, and resurrection, the blood of the lamb, it's still the same. The word of the testimony. What God is looking for, even in the places of obscurity, he's looking that when you're tested by circumstances and through people, that you respond in such a way that it becomes a testimony. If your test never becomes a testimony, you don't have substance. You've only got information. God is looking at response to the tests 
create a testimony, and the testimony is the gospel of the kingdom that is going to speak. They overcome. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. It's only through the blood of the Lamb and the Lordship of Jesus. It's only through that atonement, through the resurrection. It's by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. That means the love of the world wasn't in them, but the love of the Father was. That in everything they did, they did it as Father pleasers, not people pleasers. I'm telling you what, God's basically saying, it's time to become a because. And this is the word of the Lord for these people. And if you're watching by Ustream, I didn't cover this in the first service, but I'm saying it now. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God says, I'm raising up becauses. Each and every one of you is going to become a because. Because of Lazarus, many believed on Jesus. That was resurrection. Because of Lazarus, many believe. You are to become a because. Because of you, many are going to believe on Jesus. You're going to be a testimony of an awakening, of resurrection life on the inside of you. It's going to baffle them. I had people come to my first pastorate only because I was so bad they couldn't believe that I was preaching. They had to come. One cop even came. His whole family got saved and he wasn't. He was too cynical. He came and he says... All right, this guy is either the best con artist I've ever run into or he actually believes this stuff. You choose. I'm either the best con artist that ever lived or I actually believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. God is bringing us into this place. And if you're a note taker, write this down because this is the key. Because God doesn't allow you to skip steps. What he's looking for are those of you that know your DNA and it's a time, this is the time you're in, for a steadfast devotion to purpose. This is not a time to scatter your charms. I love Jesus, but I love this. I love my car. I love my boat. I love my Jesus. I love my... It's not on equal scale. It's seek first the kingdom. It's undivided, undiluted, Love and adoration for Jesus first as Lord. All those other things will be added unto you in the form of his blessings and his provision. His word is truth, but his will is for oneness. And the way that he does it is always love. God wants us to enforce the rule of the conquering king, but it's going to be recognizing that now is a time for oneness. In that upper room, they were not perfect people. It didn't take a move of God for them to get into one accord. It took an attitude of their heart to be in one accord. Then the power came. It wasn't the power came so they could be one accord. They were in one accord. So what does it take for people to simply say, oh boy, I'm going to risk opening up to these people that I don't know in this room for the potential of resurrection life to rise up in me and for an outpouring of God's spirit to be upon me. That's a pretty small price to pay, but it does require having ought against nobody, including yourself, others, and God. So let's pray that way in preparation for such a time as this. Father, we pray right now for the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God that we might attain unto full stature, that you might see and that we would catch a vision both generationally and corporately catch a vision for corporateness. God, it's not natural to our selfish natures. It doesn't come easy either. But insofar as you can speak to my heart and insofar as I can humble myself before you, help me to become interdependent. Help me to become aware of brothers and sisters in Christ. Help me be aware of who I'm being connected with. Help me be aware of those divine appointments who will become divine connections. Help me to cooperate with divine order so that I might align myself spiritually, properly, one with another in proper relationships, not improper relationships. Help me, God, become part of the purposes of God and the divine purposes you have for all of us in the days ahead. I'm going to pray that through one more time. Divine appointments are coming into my life. I'm going to be open to divine connections as these divine appointments come into my life. These divine appointments are going to produce divine order. This divine order is an alignment. God is weaving a tapestry together. He is building with living stones and he's placing them where they belong. 
and then I'm going to become part of a habitation of God and the divine purposes of God to serve the purposes of God for my generation. Help me in all these areas as I humble myself and allow you to work in such a way as this. It's not about convenience. It's about co-laboring. It's not about coveting. It's about, it's about commissioning. So Father, we just pray right now that we would cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the purposes of God in our generation. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.